challenges with the supply chain that we kind of saw really come into harsh light over the last couple of years with the pandemic didn't just magically appear with COVID. Um, they were there, maybe they were dormant, they were dusted over, a rug thrown over them. Um, why do you think the pandemic and then thinking forward, right? We, we also talked about this never normal that we're going to be experiencing probably for the rest of our lives, climate issues, big storms, other big events that are going to, you know, could potentially shut down supply chain and, you know, for, for a long time. Um, why do you think what happened over the last couple of years really brought some of these challenges into such harsh light? What Can you give us a little bit of insight onto, you know, why do you think all of a sudden we're all noticing this? Obviously, we've always had challenges, right? And we've gone through recessions, we've gone through hardships. But if you look at the pandemic, um, especially I think in our lifetime, never seen disruption of this size because it, it hit, it became global, right? Uh, it started obviously in Asia, but it became global very quickly. And it really hit every single country around the world and every single industry around the world. And I think just a challenge of that size we had never seen. And so it was just one thing after another with closure, with which interrupted manufacturing, then it interrupted ports, so product couldn't get shipped, or it interrupted the flow of, of product just by people. Uh, basically buying inventory at the store and then after that not enough inventory, uh, not enough uh, capability to go and ship products. So it was all of these things put together which really was depleting the company's capabilities to fight back. Right? And, and we've heard a lot yeah. about terms like agility and resilience. Just to make this more concrete and real, yeah, absolutely. So I think having your custom solution will help you show the most contextual and accurate information to the user. Right? The traditional mapping providers may or may not provide. What I mean by take uh, food delivery, for example, like you mentioned, right, from counter to couch. Right? The, when whenever there is a food delivery, the driver not just goes to a particular destination. They park the uh, car. They need to find parking first place, and they are probably walking uh, to deliver food at the door front. Right. But a traditional mapping provider might think that the ETA for the driver to drop off the food is as soon as they reach the waypoint that is map matched to the road segment. Right? They may not consider the parking or the waiting time. Right? So then you're, you're promising the eater that the food will arrive in 10 minutes, but it might take actually like 20 minutes for them to park and drive. So that leads to bad experiences if you're not considering those uh, last mile uh, ETAs, if you will. right? Uh, so that's one use case that I can think of that you need to solve for uh, and take another example that comes to mind is airports or even venues, right? At airports, traditional like, like trading company like drivers have to go to a designated spot for pickup and drop offs. However, like if you use traditional mapping providers, they will probably navigate you to the departure gate or the arrival gate, right? But if you have a custom mapping solution that helps drivers and riders get to the rendezvous point seamlessly, then that's a huge win, right? That's magical experience. We understand that various mapping providers have a uh, different sort of data quality or API quality. In fact, we always keep experimenting with uh, new mapping providers just to see whether we can do better on some of these metrics by incorporating um, data or APIs from others. Of course, Google Maps is uh, what everyone trusts, but uh, there are other providers that are also uh, doing well, especially in India, and we are looking at that. We do also do some of this internally, and uh, we can get into that more as well, uh, because we do realize that our uh, needs and our the way Swiggy deliveries need to be done seamlessly, we have some certain um, sort of customized or special requirements which um, standard mapping providers don't necessarily give and which is actually one of the biggest reasons that we did set up this internal team within Swiggy that is completely focused on location intelligence and how do we build the right data for a seamless delivery experience for Swiggy. Global players, you know, as I mentioned, like Esri, like Google, um, and as a result of those companies being so big and, and having full stack kind of 
fixed solution that they want to deliver to customers. The industry, I think, was sometimes a little bit restricted by a kind of take it or leave it approach. Um, you could have the full package um, or you could go out and do it yourself. Uh, and the going out and doing yourself was actually the um, the Genesis or kind of like help promote the really strong um, and vibrant open source community that uh, is was and continues to be really active. Getting ETA right is not just simply, you know, have a bunch of data scientists and then, you know, curating um, some sort of uh, historical data and then just jumping right into it by building a machine learning model, right? There's much more nuances that really goes beyond just the model building when you think when you kind of think about ETA. So, you know, one one way of formulating this would be you kind of approach this from you know um, building multiple parallel, you know, multiple building blocks, right? And at the really base fundamental of ETA itself is actually the map. Because if the map itself is not correct, if the road network data that the company is maintaining is not, you know, it doesn't reflect what reality actually is, then, you know, even if you have like a model on top of it, the ETA itself will never be as accurate. Jermaine talked a little bit about this, uh, the uniqueness around um, kind of the difference between a pickup and a trip ETA and um, there's a different length and, a di and distance that you have to estimate and predict. Um, I think when we look at the pandemic, that changed a lot of patterns, uh, behaviors of people, how they travel to the office or don't travel to the office, uh, where they get picked up at. Um, I think you have, um, you know, what we saw in Jakarta was that there were a lot of, like, neighborhoods had a lot more lockdowns, right? and more neighborhood level lockdown. In Jakarta, there's a lot of neighborhoods that have lift gates. They might have multiple entrances to the, to the neighborhood, but they lock one to kind of prevent uh, more and restrict access. So traffic patterns and way people move around the city drastically change. So modeling that got tough, right? And, uh, and looking at historical traffic got tough. So like, these are unique things that uh, happened over the last two years and that we had to account for and build, build something that is enabled to account for that.